got here on the bench, Mr. Fryat? This is a 2009 Pitbull 50CL. Yeah, look at that. Um, look at that. Look at that. This is uh, 2009 is the last year of the Pitbull 50CL production and the first year of the Fryat branded Pitbull amps. Ah. So um, this one went to France and... That's where the original purchase order was for? Um, or did it start here and then make its way? It started out life as a 230 volt unit and it was originally sold to our distributor in France. Hmm. So the owner of it purchased it in France and brought it back here because he lives here. So, Got it. So um, it's, a, it's a transitional amp and we're gonna have a, a bit of a look at it. All right, so um, we, have, uh, we have the original preamp tubes in it, uh, different power tubes than it was originally shipped with. We, sh we normally ship these with Mullers. Okay, just so got our preamp tubes here. So those are Shuguang 12AX7s. Okay. There is a, um, there is a, a Sovtech 12AX7 WB in stage one, which is a low microphonic, low noise 12AX7. Okay. Um, and then the stock Electroharmonics 5U4 rectifier tube. Mm -hmm. And um, the customer or the prior, prior owner had changed from the Millard's EL34s to Tung Sols. Got it. And uh, how's the amp sounding these days? Well, we haven't fired it up yet. Oh, okay. We just opened it up. All right. It was uh, the QC on this took place August 29th, 2009. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, we've given it a little visual inspection. Mm -hmm. And we're going to convert it to two, from 230 volts to 120 volts. Ooh. And then we're, we're making gonna, it a Yankee. Yeah, and then we're going to talk about the filter caps in it. And the reason we're going to talk about that is because this being the last year of the production of this model was also the last year that we used uh, axial capacitors uh, on the preamp boards. I see. We have been gradually transitioning over to radial capacitors in, in all locations uh, because most quality capacitor manufacturers are phasing out axials okay so um the the quality and the range of 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 specifications of axial capacitors has narrowed a lot while the the availability of different ranges and, and specification parameters of radials has expanded just exponentially the the temperature ratings, the, the ripple current ratings, the actual capacitance ratings themselves, the voltage ratings are all much more plentiful than axials these days. Okay. So, uh, and they're also made with improved materials and stuff, and the quality is improving. So that means that they get smaller, and it's okay for them to be smaller because they're they perform well even though they're physically smaller and had the axials kind of been the the caps of choice during the vht era for the most part we actually started the transition away from axials uh in 2000 in 2001 or two in the power amp specifically oh okay um just because the cost was skyrocketing to get really good ones mm -hmm. and they use up a lot of you know real estate sure and of course the pcbs in the power amps are not these long narrow affairs they're more compact square or small rectangle style boards so needed that real estate uh yeah getting everything uh comfortably arranged into a, into a, a smaller footprint like that pretty much uh needs to be done with radial capacitors. Now, this board was originally done with large axials, oh, the, no the real big ones. And that's why this board is so big and has these hmm. axials spread out on it. And there's a lot of wasted real estate space there because the mounting holes for the original boards that held the axials 
didn't change because we still had the same chassis. We changed the board to radials because we wanted to have better quality, more plentiful supply and backup sources of radials. So that board got changed for radial caps even though the physical size of the board didn't change. Mm -hmm. So all new designs after this period, the power supply got a lot more compact because it didn't require all that extra board real estate. So now uh, in around early to mid 2000s, we had a supplier who was making axial capacitors uh, that were rebranded. And we talked about that on previous shows where right, some suppliers right. rebrand their capacitors so you really don't know who the manufacturer is. Mm -hmm. What a and, joy. And uh, <clears throat> they either tell you when you ask or they don't tell you. Uh, if they don't tell you, they have to come up with a really good spec sheet that looks legit, looks like they're really the specs for the part. Mm -hmm. Still, you may not necessarily know who makes it. But if you have a spec sheet, you have a chance to compare what they're offering to what our other standard capacitor suppliers are offering. We buy Nichicon, Panasonic, um, CDE, um, uh, United Chemicon, Nippon Chemicon, which is also United Chemicon, only it's a Japanese company, but they still use the United Chemicon name, even though it's a Japanese company that has capacitors that are produced in China. Uh, you see all these names floating around. Uh, and so unless you do actually the footwork yourself, you never really know who's making what or to what quality level. And that's why you have to do this background research. For example, um, most guys, repair guys, if you ask them about CDE filter capacitors, they'll say, oh yeah, Cornell DB, those are, those are pretty good quality. Mm -hmm. And if I say, what do you think about IC capacitors? Oh, that's crap. I would never use that. Okay, uh, and then I would say Illinois capacitors have been around for 80 years, you know. Uh, why do you think they're so bad? They've been around for so long. Well, they're just bad. Why are they bad? They won't really tell you why. Mm -hmm. I know in the past I didn't like Illinois capacitors because the lead wires that came out of the cans was really thin. Okay. So the, the leads were a little wimpy, and mm -hmm. I just thought that, you know, I sort of equated that with quality. Okay. Until I started learning more about capacitors and how they should be mounted and a good way to mount them and secure them if they were in a vibration, a, lo a high vibration environment. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the wimpy lead wires might be an issue, but the capacitors themselves were actually pretty decent quality. Okay. Well, anybody that says today Illinois capacitors are still crap, I don't care what you say. My question would be, but you think CDE capacitors are good quality, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, those are really good. They've been around a really long time. Would it interest you to know that CDE bought Illinois in 2015 and are making Illinois-branded capa capacitors now in the same factory oh. that the CDE capacitors are made? Plot now what would you say? <laughs> and they would probably go, ah, bah, bah. <laughs> So it pays to do your homework. This for example, is a TTAA series Illinois capacitor. There's the IC logo right there. However, these are relatively new parts, and they are made in the CDE manufacturing plant no in China. Huh. So they, and the, the leads are actually the same lead diameter as CDE and Nichicon and Panasonic and all the other ones. So uh, the, uh, the seal, it looks good. They tend to be physically smaller. So this is a, this is a 33 mic, yeah. 450 volt capacitor. This mm -hmm. is a 22 mic, 500 volt capacitor. Okay. So you can see there's quite a difference in size. However, the specs on these are just about the same as the specs on these in terms of ripple current and, uh, working voltage and, um, and a tolerance okay. temp and temperature rating, 85 degrees, looks like. Yeah. So you can never just go by a name, and if, and, and if you're like all bent out of shape because it's got the Illinois capacitor logo on it, that's personal bias. That's not 
a technical reason to use or not use that capacitor. So we have to be careful not to get caught up in that. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to check these to make sure that they're not the rebranded ones that we have ran into problems with in the mid-2000s. And we're going to do that by looking at the logo and testing them on the LCR meter, which will hey, give, look us, at that. give us a, a reliable what do, what do we got here? reading. This Looks is an like LCR meter. So it, it tests inductance, capacitance, and resistance. Is, is that a new will, piece of gear? Yes, yeah, pretty like new. It. I had another one that bit the dust, so I bought a better one. Oh, okay. And uh, what it does is it it actually tests the capacitor as if it's operating in a circuit. So you get a really good accurate reading. So we're going to check that. So the first thing that we're going to do is rewire it and then we'll be back. Is this drum solo? I don't know. Let me know. All right, we're back. What'd we do? Okay, so we've converted it from 230 volts to 120 volts. It's all been rewired in here. We put a new power switch in. We put uh, new fuse holders in to accommodate the domestic fuse values okay. that the uh, that the U.S. unit uh, operates with, and um, and then we added the three-way ground switch that we didn't use on the Euro units. Okay. So this is all. Wait a minute. The, what was in that? Uh... It, was, it had a it had a plug in there. Oh. It's, it's a blank hole that had a plug in it. Okay, I'm trying to focus, 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 focus. There we go. So before we fire it up, we're going to do uh, one quick little thing, which is we're going to use the LCR meter and we're going to test the filter caps. Now, being a 2009 amp, that's uh, that's 13 years old. There's no way that there's going to be anything wrong with capacitors. Uh, and not only that, but they don't look rough either. Um, for those guys who have um, leakage testers for eyes, <laughs> um, I don't. So I have test equipment to tell me that. So we're going to just clip this in here. And for the people that say, well, you know, hey, I don't want to go buy an expensive piece of test equipment and, and to check the capacitors when I know that they should probably be replaced anyway. And if I have to pull out the board to read the bottom of the capacitors, you know, then I might as well just replace them and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so my attitude is, why would you transfer the cost of your lack of test equipment onto the consumer having them to buy capacitors they don't need? That would be my response. So this is a 200 mic capacitor here, 350 volts, and I'm testing it in circuit, which will affect the tolerance, apparent tolerance, a little bit, but it'll give me an accurate reading of where that capacitor is. So it's a 200, uh, 20 mic cap and it's reading 184 mics which is pretty close to 200 so given that it's in circuit that's well within tolerance and here's the other one that's over. stacked up in series with it 188 same thing it's in circuit with the same components so we're getting the same value which further validates that they're legit these capacitors are 100 mics and because of they're being tested in a circuit. I'm probably going to get about 80 something mics. There's 81 right there. And the other one in series with it. And we're at 83. That's good. So here are the bias supply capacitors. These are 47 mic caps. And that one's 45. That one's reading 45. So we're all good there. <clears throat> Over here, we have axial capacitors, which I think I mentioned earlier. Right. Um, this is the last of the models that we made with axial caps because they were going bye-bye from the uh, capacitor suppliers. So these are 30 mic capacitors. And there they are reading 30 mics. 28, that's well within tolerance. 33, well within tolerance. Even though they're checking good, I'm not taking that 100% on faith because sometime between two th the mid-2000s and 2009, we bought capacitors, which I think I mentioned previously, from a local supplier that rebranded capacitors under their brand name mm -hmm. and would not divulge who the actual supplier was. 
and they turned out to be really flaky capacitors and we had to replace a few of them um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna lift one up okay because we put those in in such a way that you can't read the brand from the top. Uh -huh. So I'm just gonna lift a leg up on one of them. I'm pretty sure that these are post the screwy rebranded ones, but I'm gonna be sure. First of all, I'm lifting it out of circuit to verify that it's legit. And there it is, legit. But I'm also going to lift it up the board. Now it's, it's secured with um, it's secured with silicone sealant so that it doesn't vibrate off the board and I'm just pulling that off. And this is the ARS capacitor. This is the rebranded cap that fa that would fail frequently. Oh, how about that? Now looking at that I have real reservations about it. I recall at the time when we got these that they had a rubber seal on both ends, mm -hmm. which you normally see only on a uh, non-polarized capacitor. But this is a polarized capacitor. So there's something, there was something kind of suspicious going on with the assembly of this. You normally wouldn't see that mm -hmm. in a normal electrolytic. And because of the fact that we actually did have some of these fail, even though it reads correctly, and if I put a leakage current tester on it, it might even pass the leakage current test. But given that I knew how many of them failed and that I never did find out who manufactured the capacitors, this was one of the first times I had learned that lesson that, you know, do your research. You got to you gotta really know. Mm. So I am going to replace these, even though, Whoa. even though they look fine, they read fine, uh, and the, the owner of the amp says it sounds just fine. He just wanted to check it out. And because one of you viewers commented, why don't you guys do a video of you repairing one of your own amps? And I thought, well, there'd be a perfect opportunity to do that. So this is what we're going to do. You we're are gonna, actually replacing... I'm going to replace... Yeah. We need some confetti. I'm going to replace a capacitor that has validated itself on a, a couple of different tests. Uh -huh. Because I know that we actually had failure issues with this brand. And... This will be a case where I got it open. I have reservations about it. Uh, the owner is a good customer. Let's just go ahead and do Let's it. Let's just go ahead and do it. I'm doing it from the top of the board. I'm not taking it out. Because A, I don't need to take the board out. B, all the uh, traces that go to the capacitor or on the top side of the board. And that's just normally the way we do it. Is if, there, if it isn't absolutely necessary to yank the board out, I prefer not to do it. <laughs> How come? What a weird thing. There are there are a lot of leads underneath the oh, board. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's obviously a, a giant undertaking. Well, actually, I could probably get this board up, the capacitor is replaced, and back down in the space of 20 minutes. But I, I already know what it's like under there, that I don't need to worry about it, that I don't want to disturb any of the leads underneath, and that this is a perfectly legit way to do this. All right, so I'm gonna go grab the replacement capacitors from stock and I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, so um, we've got these nice- Let's see one of these suckers up Nichicon close. Nichicon 33 mic 450 volt. And this, obviously this amp isn't in production right now, but this is what you're using in general. Uh, this is what we bought for replacements when we work on 
older gear. Oh, okay. It's not that we never replace capacitors. Right. It's it's only that we replace them when needed and it's, not when not needed. It's the reasoning behind the replacement that you are concerned with. Yeah. Now I wanted to show you something fun, which is um, a uh, leakage current tester that I'm building, and I actually wanted to have it done in time for this video so that we could show it show it to you working in real life. But not quite done yet. There's a couple of parts that we're waiting for to arrive. Um, but it'll be an additional test on top of uh, the LCR capacitor test. Do we want to talk about this thing? Um, or do we want I to let it we'll go for I think we'll talk about it more when we actually have it up and running and I can just demonstrate how it works. But basically, you can take a capacitor that's been sitting on the shelf for a long time and not only can you test its leakage, mm -hmm. if it's an older capacitor, to mm -hmm. see if it's developed some leakage, uh -huh. but we can also it'll also help us explain about reforming capacitors uh, now some people say our oh, reforming is bs but what a lot of people don't really understand about capacitors is that they get reformed every time you turn them on that makes sense and the reason for that is is because the electrolyte inside the capacitor creates an oxide layer on one side of one of the anode plates uh, and that oxide layer begins to deplete when the capacitor isn't operating at a very small amount. But when you look at capacitor specs, you'll see one specification that says shelf life. <laughs> and it'll usually say something like a thousand hours or something. But what it's basically saying is while the capacitor is sitting unused, it is the, uh, the, um, uh, the, electrolyte is changing just from sitting mm -hmm. so uh the uh the oxide layer is decomposing when the capacitor is first made it's formed a voltage is applied to it to establish this polarity that's called forming capacitor so reforming is just restoring that um that uh, uh oxide layer into an operational capacitor again. So one thing maybe you notice that I did is I put a little bit of um, RTV on the board underneath the capacitor. It's a really effective way of securing the capacitor. Some people like to... Is that silicone? To, yeah. Some people like to, to design uh, holes in the board that you can put tie wraps through uh. to uh, secure those. But I found that this method is a lot more effective and long lasting because it doesn't stretch, it doesn't dry out, and it forms a little cushion under the capacitor that keeps it in position and won't allow it to vibrate loose so it won't um, affect. Does it, it just won't show up in like a, a caulking tube? looking yeah yeah oh there it is oh yeah yeah good old Order. ge <laughs> uh, kitchen and bath projects hot dog so what this um what this leakage current tester can do is it can actually reform capacitors and you can see how much they need to be reformed based on how long they've been sitting on the shelf wow and when the oxide layer is depleted, the leakage current will be higher. But that doesn't mean the capacitor got leakier. It just meant that it got leakier for the period that it was sitting unused. And after you reform it, that leakage will resolve itself. If it doesn't, then you've got a bad capacitor and it'll tell you that. Because sure. you'll be able to watch the leakage current dissipate as it's reforming. If the leakage current doesn't go down below a certain threshold, then the capacitor is leaky. Again, everything can be measured. This doesn't test leakage current. So on a much older amplifier, I'll want to know more about the leakage current than on something like this where I know that's not going to be an issue. Got it. <clears throat> so we got the nice new Nichicon 33 mic 450s in there. We've validated the power supply. We've re 
wired the AC input, so we're ready to throw voltage at it. And I am not going to slowly bring it up on the Variac because it's not that old. I believe the owner, when he purchased it, has already turned it on and played it to check out how it sounds. He's already heard it when he went and bought it. He turned it on and played it to make sure that it was good before he bought it. So within the last six months to maybe even two weeks, the thing has already been powered up. So any reforming that the capacitors might have undergone by charging it up has already occurred. If it was going to be enough current, uh, excess current to damage the capacitor, we would see it. Nice thing about axials is you see all that right on the very top. It's right of the on capacitor. the top. Yeah, it would, it would it would be yeah, it would be curved out if there was going to be any issue. This is actually the highest current operating capacitor in the whole amp. This has the high voltage, but this one experiences the highest ripple current. So this would be one of the first ones to go if that was going to be the case. Okay. That's a 12 volt power supply there. So that's a very low voltage, but a very high amount of current. So that would be one of the first ones to go zippity doo if that was going to be a problem. Now that we have it in circuit, we know that we had capac 33 mic capacitors that read 33 mics in circuit, out of circuit, and here they are reading 31 and a half in circuit. So I'm not really telling myself anything I didn't already know. I'm just sort of demonstrating for you guys how small these parameter changes are and how to recognize what they mean. Okay, so even though I'm not gonna use a Variac to bring up the power, I am going to monitor the DC power at the supply once I fire it up. Now this one, this amp does not get high voltage applied to the filter capacitors when you first turn on the power. The first thing that gets powered up is the volt, low voltage supply, which is here. So we're gonna see about mm, between 75 and 90 volts right here. I'm set up to DC. I'm checking my AC line voltage. It's at 119 and we're ready to rock and there we are 74 volts and then we have our bias supply which did energize and there is the uh, bias voltage on the control grids of the EL34 is 34 volts negative which is what they should be and the Plate voltage is not energized yet. It's showing 200 and it's showing a quarter of a volt, which is just residual voltage bleed. No voltage is getting anywhere yet. I've got it plugged into an 8 ohm load. I have it set at 8 ohms. I'm going to feed a signal into the effects return. I'm going to eva activate the effects loop and I'm going to turn the effects level up. And the effects are before the global master. The effects loops are after the channel volumes. Channel gains, channel volumes. The channel volumes on this amp are equivalent to a typical master volume on, say, like a JCM 800. There's, but there's two of them. So we have a master, a global master to control the other two in essence, master volumes for those channels when you set high gain. Yeah, it's a, it's a so I'm going to use the global master to regulate the signal coming back out of the effects loop once we fire it up so we can see it on the scope. Now let's see, do I have everything triggered properly? I need channel one as the trigger source. And since we're going to power up the DC supply now. Here we go. 435 volts, right where it belongs. And I've got a square wave coming out of my function generator. Let's switch that to a sign and run that up to full output. And there we have our sine wave at clipping. We have a little bit of a there we 
very nice sine wave. This amp has got solid state rectifiers and a tube rectifier in it, and you can switch between them. We're operating off of the solid state rectifier now. When I go to the tube rectifier, you see the voltage drop down and you see the crossover distortion increase. This is typically what you see when you have a tube rectifier. It's sagging and as the voltage goes down, the crossover distortion goes up at full power. You don't see that much of it right. at about a half the power output, right. but when you get up to the full power output, then you start to see some crossover distortion because the power tubes are maxed out. Well, and it's a then, visual res representation of how it feels. Right. It's going to be spongier. It's mm -hmm. going to have a little bit more fizz. It's going to sound more saturated. Yeah. It's going to have that that gushy feel that a lot of people love. Yeah. And then we're going to go back to the solid state rectifier and we're like way up there. No crossover distortion. The bias is on this one basically set perfectly and I'm not going to mess with it. So then we go check the square wave response. Here's the presence control. There's the depth control. And then we go into the front of the amp, drop the signal from the function generator way down, because we don't need hardly any gain for that. And we need to be back in the sine wave. And here's the bass control, the middle control, the treble control, and gain boost there, uh, right there shift in and out there, additional gain stage there, giving us a real exaggerated square wave, and then same thing on the other channel. Super high gain, regular high gain, boost off, right off, shift off, bass, middle, treble. And then we go and we add the graphic EQ right here. Now, the EQ is set flat, so you don't see anything happening to the square wave, except a barely perceptible little level difference. Then we have... Um, <clears throat> what happens if you jack up the high end? Probably those little peaks. Well, here's the high end. Yep, that's what I got. This is 5K. Uh -huh. This is 2.2K. Mm. This is... Uh, 1.2k. See, it mm. covers a pretty broad spectrum mm -hmm. of the mid range. Here's 630 hertz, low mids. Yeah. And here's uh, 250 hertz, low end, and this is 100 hertz, way low end. Swamp butt. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so everything there is good. Oh, one other thing I forgot to do. This amp also has a Class A mode, capital bias mode. So I'm gonna get rid of some of that excessive overdrive. Get a lower gain. Push the push the power amp stage sound a little bit there, and then turn on the class A mode. Let's get a little bit more of that, okay. The, the shape of the, of the signal doesn't change much. It's really the gain of the tube that's putting out a little less power. Mm -hmm. The gain is going down a little bit, but it gives you a little bit more of a bark in that mode. Uh, I'm doing something you're not supposed to be doing, which is switching it from class AB to class A mode with signal going through it, but I'm doing it under controlled circumstances and I'm not slamming it. So that's why I'm um, sort of breaking that rule. We're going to plug it into a 412 cabinet, which means that we're switching it to 16 ohms. Uh-oh. And what I find is that the 16 ohm switch position appears to be broken. Let's just double check that before we go any farther. That's not normally something that people break, but hey, there's always an exception the rule. That's the 8 ohm setting. Don't do this at home, but that's the 4 ohm setting. And 
Okay, 16 comes on, but the switch is really loose there. It's barely hanging on to 16 ohms. So we're gonna replace that switch. Not gonna do it right now. It's still a valid enough connection that will. Ha! Ah, look at that. That was off the top turnbuckle, man. Body slam. Double check to make sure everything is good. Yeah, I just did that for all the people that are really squeamish about throwing amps around. These are made to be thrown out of the back of the trucks for crying out loud. If I can't do it, I mean, isn't that why they're designed that way? To be brutalized? So, I give myself permission to brutalize the crap out of this. All right, so what, uh, we took a little break for a second because it's the last day before Christmas and uh, uh, the whole team here got together and had a little bit of vino to uh, send us off for the weekend. I had a lot. <laughs> Whoa. And so the last two things we're doing is checking uh, final little little checking before we give this thing a clean bill of health. We had established that we needed a um, uh, an impedance selector switch that we're going to change later. We already know the impedance selector works right now, but it's a little fishy, so we're going to put a new switch in it for the customer after we're done with all this. And the last thing I noticed is we've got a little bit of oxidation on an input jet. So we're going to address that right now. It's not cutting it, so we still have something else that we have to look for. Okay, so what we got going on here is an input jack that's not closing to ground when it's disconnected. It's right here. You can see this little tab here. When I press it down, it stops. So that's not grounding all the way. Got it. So we just tweak the jack contact a little bit so that it makes a good solid ground and we're good yeah. a little more tweak there we go just needed more wine Steve just needed another half a glass of fucking murder <laughs> <laughs> See, I never thought about Merlot one way or the other until I saw Sideways. And then after that, it was like, I'm sure that one line just decimated the Merlot. Oh, it just defines it now. Yeah. <clears throat> but. There's nothing wrong with Merlot. You know, you, know what they say, you know what they say about certain wines, like white wine, you know what they say? Yeah. They say. White wine is what you drink after all the red wine is gone. Well, I would I would agree with that, but yeah. that's just me. Yeah, I mean that's there. There are some great wine. There's actually some really great German Gewurztraminers and, and things like that that are. All right, so uh, we're all cleaned up on the inside, and we're gonna flip it over, and we're gonna test it one more time, and just to make sure that all the people that are really squeamish about amplifiers are rolling around, I'm gonna do this one more time. Oh to make sure that it's really as solidly built as we... Is this how fry -it amps are bench tested? Every single one of them. Wow. So starting with the green channel in low gain mode. Running into a deliverance cab with the fame speakers.
channel with the boost off and all the other button shift right all that stuff off I think this is uh, a good um, Christmas wrap up for the um, uh, throwing shit on the bench just for fun because we can because we like to and uh, an opportunity to make some noise have a glass of wine have a great Christmas you guys drink the rest of that see you next week we'll do a New Year's version well, we got another special little surprise for you. So we'll do, this will be our Christmas wrap-up show. And then next week we'll do a New Year's wrap-up video with some more fun stuff. And I should stop talking now because... Drink it, it's, it's drink it, drink it, and talking. say goodnight. Goodnight, nurse. <laughs> <laughs>